Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. The FIDE World Chess Championship is less than a week away, starting November 26th in Dubai. I cannot wait. We've got lots of coverage coming on Perpetual Chess that I will tell you all about in a minute before we get into an excellent World Chess Championship preview slash interview with the always entertaining and insightful Grandmaster Daniel King. But first, a few things to make sure you guys are all aware of, including what we have planned here on Perpetual Chess. Number one, be sure to join the Aim Chess Prediction Challenge. Shout out to our friends at Aim Chess. Go to magnusnepo.com. It's a free contest where you make guesses based on what the results and openings you'll see. You may see in this match and you can win cool prizes like a signed wooden chess board by Magnus Carlsen and stuff like that. So magnusnepo.com, link in the show description, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, Perpetual Chess is planning a bonus episode. So we're dropping this one early so that you guys have time to listen to all of our World Chess Championship coverage. And then on the regularly scheduled slot, Tuesday, November 23rd, we'll be dropping part two. And this, of course, is more big picture chess history. Daniel King talks about their chess styles and what he expects. And on Tuesday, November 23rd, we'll be getting into the analytics of the World Chess Championship with Ty Pruce Zimmerman, who has the excellent Chess by the Numbers blog. So we'll be getting into what you can expect in terms of how likely is it that there'll be 14 draws and uh, different things based on Ty's predictive model. I'll also be sharing a quote from GM Jakob Augard regarding what he, he expects in this match. Um, And then we've also got tons of bonus coverage coming your way once the match actually gets underway. So starting November 29th, which is the first rest day, we will be dropping Perpetual Chess shorter bonus pods on every rest day. I'll be talking to people in Dubai and just sort of talking about what's going on at the match. So I'll be interviewing people like journalists, players, fans. Some of them you may have heard of, some of them you haven't. But obviously there's going to be plenty of game recaps on YouTube. YouTube, and I think that is the best way to consume a game recap. So what I want to do is talk to people who are there and get a sense of what it's like and just sort of keep track of who is winning the horse race. So again, we'll have bonus episodes, shorter episodes for you on every rest day during the world championship. But we aren't going to slack on the regular perpetual chess interviews. Those are still going to come out every Tuesday um, along with the bonus pods. Now, I also wanted to just run down a few things you all may need to know regarding uh, how to watch this match, how to keep up with it. Um, Obviously, you can find some stuff like this online as well, so we'll keep it short. But starting November 26th, it's a 14-game match. If it's tied, they go to a tie break. The schedule of games are they play each Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then they're off on Monday and then they play Tuesday and Wednesday, and then they're off on Thursday. So that's the schedule every week. Chess.com also has a nice, clearly presented schedule that I will link to. Uh, The times of the match are early for you uh, West Coasters in the U.S., 4.30 a.m. California time, 7.30 New York time, 12.30 London time, and you can find out the other times on this handy-dandy chart that I will link to from chess.com. A few other things to keep in mind. You guys may have heard about all the awesome broadcast teams that all of the chess sites have lined up. Uh, Chess.com will have I am Daniel Wrench, GM Robert Hess, and none other than Fabiano Caruana announcing. The FIDE official announcing team will be Almira Skripchenko and Grandmaster Viswanathan Anand. Chess24 actually has two teams uh, presenting the quote-unquote advanced Team will be none other than GM Anish Giri and Judith Polgar, and then their popular um, Eurosport regular team will be Grandmaster David Howell, Yovanka Hauska, and Kaya Snare. So, just so many awesome choices of what to watch, and I believe that all of those are free. Um, 
And that's about it. So really looking forward to the match. I think you guys will enjoy the, this interview with Daniel King. And then we'll have another one coming with Ty Bruce Zimmerman on Tuesday. And then boom, on Friday, it's finally go time. So without further ado, let's get to our interview with Daniel King. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have one of my favorite YouTube presenters joining us this week. He is, of course, known for the popular channel Power Play Chess, although not as popular as it should be, despite having <laughs> some 88,000 subscribers. He is an English chess grandmaster. He's represented England internationally, won many tournaments. And by the way, he's beaten the likes of Anand and Korchnoi, um, prolific author, broadcaster, and most recently chessable author of King's Kalashnikov Sicilian which I have been checking out and enjoying some swashbuckling Sicilian chess. Um, and he's been doing a series on his YouTube channel about the world championship. So um, we're going to, of course, do one last big preview of the world championship with our guest, but we've also got lots of other stuff to discuss. So without further ado, let's welcome back Grandmaster Daniel King to the show. Daniel, how are you? Oh, I'm very well. Nice, Nice to be here, Ben. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Yeah, I'm so excited for the World Championship, as I am to talk with you. And I just want to dive right into the match. Although I think we're in the stage of like uh, the run up where it's starting to feel like everything that can be said has been said. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's but time not, to but play. Not everyone has said it. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. That's yeah. the old UN thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's just there's so much anticipation at this point, but I've been mm. greatly enjoying your YouTube series. You've been going through uh, some of their historical clashes, uh, Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomnici, of course. Um, so what has struck you in looking at those games, Daniel? Well, the, they're both, um, how can I put it, multifaceted. You know, there's this kind of old trope that, Carlson is the one that plays these smooth positional games and quite tries to restrict his opponent. Um, and, and that Nepo is the, is the tactician, you know, the dynamic player who's going to try and upset things. But, you know, sometimes that flips around completely. So, you know, looking at, for example, Carlson's first classical or only classical win against Nepo in 2019, now, this was a game where Nepo tried as white to put this positional squeeze on, on Carlsen. And it was Carlsen who was breaking out with these dynamic pawn sacrifices. You know, if, he, if you'd said to someone blind, you know, who's playing white, who's playing black, then, you know, that familiar trope would have just been flipped on its head. So, um, yeah, they're both really varied, basically, in their style. So, you know... I find it really hard to say what is going to come up in this match. Yeah, I've sensed from your videos. I love that you've been sort of, as I mentioned to you in a comment on your Patreon page, I'm, of course, a eager supporter of uh, your content. Um, I'd mentioned that I liked that you weren't you weren't pulling punches. You were saying, like, I don't think Nepo's going to play the Grunfeld, for example. Um, it, you know, there's just too many landmines, basically, as you as you try to to walk your way through it. And you've also alluded to the fact that you think Nepo has a, a strong chance. But I also get the sense hearing you now that you ju you just feel like the the range of outcomes is wide. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, with for example, the, the match against uh, Fabiano. You know, Caramuana is is kind of an he has an even temperament and quite an even style that's sort of reflected on the chessboard. Um, and those games were very even. There weren't huge blunders by either player. Um, and yeah, I mean, twelve draws in the classical games was not not the outcome that perhaps was to be desired. But but it was a reflection that they were very even. But I. With Nepo, I think, you know, we get all kinds of chess. We get some very unusual moves sometimes. Uh, we get mistakes. We get absolutely brilliant moves. And, and I think that will also rub off on Carlsen as well. Now, of course, the openings are going to have a, a lot to do with that. Now, yeah, you mentioned the, the Grunfeld. Although, you know, we've seen that this is one of Nepo's kind of favorite openings. I, I, f I will find it amazing 
if he tries this out because it, there are so many forcing variations and I think it's it's the kind of opening that it's very easy to prepare against. I was even amazed in the candidates tournament that he actually played it a few times. I mean, that showed incredible confidence, but actually he almost came unstuck when he played it. Uh, it was against Grishuk, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, you know, he risked it a few times and I just can't see him doing that. I think we're going to see um, quite a, a broad range of openings. That's, that's my feeling. Um, and and maybe a, a little bit more solid. But, you know, in that candidates tournament showed us that how hard Nepo's been working, you know, against E4, we saw him playing the Petrov. Wow. You know, huh, who, yeah. who would have thought that? We didn't see the Nidorf. Again, he might play the Nidorf. In some ways, I think it's a more solid opening than the Grunfelds, strangely enough. Um, but we also saw the French winnower wow yeah now, he risked that he played it once and i thought he's not going to play that again and then of course he played it against vashi Legrave and got his head blown off <laughs> and you know he he pushed it too far basically <laughs> um and i thought yeah mm, <laughs> that was a bit much because is it a very risky opening but he almost got away with it um so yeah i you know i see that him, him broadening out his openings and, and, and that's fascinating and that Petrov that he won against Wang Hao was a beautiful strategic game you know Carlson could have been playing that game so do you see what I mean about the, the familiar trope uh, in their styles really I don't think kind of works anymore <laughs> it's really hard to say what what we're going to see yeah, and there's also the question of just the level at which they will play, because uh, Nepo, of course, kind of ascended to a new level at the candidates. Um, Matt Jensen did a nice write-up kind of looking at the analytics on chess.com, um, and he he sort of isolated the performance rating of Nepo in the recent tournaments, and obviously, statistically, that changes the profile of uh what's the most likely outcome greatly because the, his most recent performance ratings are right on a par with Magnus. Whereas if you look at sort of the wider scope of history and of course with Nepo's sort of reputation for maybe not finally having found his focus, as people say, mm -hmm. it makes it a little harder to candy cap because we can't, we don't know is, is he at a new level or did he just have a good tournament? And um, Magnus is on the one hand, a bit more of a constant, but on the other, has struggled a bit in world championships. So mm. it's it, it just makes it hard hard to assess. Very hard to assess. And and don't forget that Nepo won the Russian championship as well in, in rather brilliant style. So, you know, that, I think for me, that says a lot. You know, it's, some people might say it's harder to win the Russian championship than the candidates. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So that shows some kind of consistency in classical chess. But yeah, I find it really hard to predict. I mean, there are so many reasons why it's hard to predict. Just because the pair of them have played very little classical chess in the past two years. I mean, that in itself is a randomizer, I think. But there's there's one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, so Nepo has this 4-1 score in classical chess. And people have kind of dismissed this because, you know, two of the games were played when they were very young in junior tournaments. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that this plus score is significant in itself, but here's how I think it might be significant is that, you know, there isn't that kind of, I, I don't think Nepo feels the kind of magic and mystery of, of Magnus's play. Yeah. He knows him incredibly well. They've worked together. They played as kids. They know each other's styles, basically. And, you know, so... I don't think Nepo is going to be intimidated by him in any way. He will know what to expect. He knows how Magnus thinks. And I, I, when I, I think it makes a, a big difference. When I think of um, some of my English colleagues, you know, when I was playing actively, who were better than me? Players like, uh, well, you know, let's let's go from the top. You know, Michael Michael Adams, Nigel Short, and and down, uh, and John Nunn, others. They're, they're stronger than me. However, because I knew these players very well, I'd played against them, you know, all my life, I kind of knew what to expect. So 
for example, my score against Michael Adams was actually better than it should have been, <laughs> if you see what I mean, because I knew him very well and I sort of knew what to expect. And, and I think the same might apply with Nepo. So that's another kind of randomizer. Yeah, and I agree with you about the sort of head-to-head -head confrontation, although, as I've mentioned before, Magnus also seems quite confident. I mean, I was struck by his his quote that his biggest edge is that he's better at chess, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, he has the right to say that. Um, yeah. But one thing that I wonder about is the sort of alleged sort of pressure cooker of the World Championship. Um, Peter Doggers of Chess.com did a fantastic interview with uh, Fabiano Caruana, and if I'm not mixing the tons of chess previews that I've watched. Yeah. I believe they showed like a shot of what it was like in the sort of um, glassed off room when you sit down to play and you could hear all the cameras clicking and just how intense that seemed was just unbelievable to me. So, um, it, you know, something like that, he might not fear Magnus on like an individual level, but with the, the media obligations and, uh, you know, the, the pressure cooker of the world championship, it's possible that would, would get to him. Um, but on the other hand, it, you know, uh, Karyak and, and Caruana in recent memory were in the same boat, you know, brand new to the world championship. And, uh, you know, that didn't seem to be a decisive factor, the uh, experience factor. So but, yet another thing that's hard to handicap. Absolutely. But, you know, 2018, um, I remember that first game where Magnus had a winning position and blew it. Yeah. Um, and... Funnily enough, I, I could, I mean, I was, I was there, I was the press officer in 2018. And in that first game, Fabiano looked really nervous. There's no doubt in my mind. And yeah, he, he did not play that first game very well. Although, you know, Magnus blew it at the end. And I have to say, the, the whole setup there, it was really claustrophobic. I mean, they were playing behind this glass screen where they people could see in, but obviously they couldn't really see out very clearly at all. I mean, it was pretty obscured. But you could kind of vaguely sense people. Um, and then when they went off, you know, off stage to their kind of restrooms, where they had, you know, drinks and whatever, um, again, it was really tight. Uh, it was windowless. There was there was only um, there was no natural light. Um, I mean that's just the the, the way that you know the, the the rooms were. You know they couldn't do anything about that. I mean I would, it was not ideal in any any way. I have to say, and it felt so pressured. So that is another factor. I mean Fabiano obviously got used to it, but that first game, you could sense it. There was extraordinary pressure. And and the and the environment did not help that. So I'm I'm sure it will be better in Dubai, where we were playing in London was a very old building that was kind of adapted. You know, they they s stuck up a wall, <laughs> you know, it's right. kind of artificial, you know, backstage. They kind of created a stage and created these rooms back. So I'm sure uh, Dubai Expo, modern building, um, it'll be much better. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the fact Nepo already alluded to having trouble sleeping during the second half of the candidates. You know, if something like that crops up, like, I don't know how at the level that these guys play, like, I don't know how you can compete mm. if you're having trouble sleeping. But on the other hand, I don't know how you sleep. Like, I have trouble sleeping in my little weekend tournaments, you know, like and this is the, yeah. the world championship. So I know um, the feeling. No, absolutely. No, definitely. Yeah. You know, and, you know, we've seen that before. I mean, there are those incredible um pictures of of uh, magnus in let me see i think it was in calcutta um i think it was in calcutta or was it in sochi they they all kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> do you know what i mean i think it was calcutta uh, no not uh, what am i talking about chennai oh good grief um in chennai in 2013 where he he seemed to be like half asleep at the board you know when he was slumped in his chair i mean you know, he obviously didn't sleep very well before then. And yeah, I mean, the pressure is just enormous. And, and yeah, that can tell on both players. You know, we're talking about pressure on Nepo. There is massive pressure on Magnus as well. There really is. So, yeah, any, anything could happen. All bets are off somehow. 
step. Yeah. So, I mean, your final analysis in previewing it is that it's, you know, borderline toss up. It sounds like, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like if anything, you know, it's become a meme online that everyone says Magnus is the favorite, but Nepo has the chance, a chance. But I do feel like there's like a bit of a sort of line of demarcation where like most predictive models based on ELO, um, as I'll be talking about with uh, uh, Ty Bruce Zimmerman of uh, Chess by the Numbers uh, coming next week. And uh, most betting markets have it more like three to one. So maybe even four to one. So giving Magnus wow. like a 75 to 80% chance. But then, you know, it sounds like from what you're saying, you give Nepo a better chance. I know Nigel Short said it was 60%, 40%. Um, of course, in the people I've interviewed in recent months, most have favored Magnus, but uh, Grandmaster Kramnik and Andy Soltis both seem to think it was a toss-up or possibly even favored Nepo. So anyway, where do you come down on this debate? Okay, of, uh, if, if you're getting odds at three to one or four to one, for for Carlson winning, um, or, 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 or so the it would be the other way around. Yeah, the, so excuse me, the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would take it. I really would. I mean, yeah. I, I, I find. Uh, I mean, we we had a discussion last time about <laughs> right, betting odds, and, yeah. and I find it particularly weird in a, in a one to one, where basically it's a zero sum game. You know, at yeah. the end of it, it's one nil. <laughs> you know, it's a hundred percent. Right. Um, so, so it's kind of kind of strange. But yeah, I mean, I I would consider those very very good odds uh, for for Nepo basically. Um, yeah, I think it's much. I think it's just unpredictable. But a lot of it's to do with temperament. And Nepo, you know, in the past seems to be a little bit impetuous, um, but he seems to have that under control at the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, people have been whispering in his ear for six months straight. Like anyone who's like an armchair quarterback and like can get his ear, you know, that's what they're going to say. They're going to say, don't move too fast, you know, like, (laughs) so it's, it's hard to believe that, like, I, I agree with, with what you've said. He does seem to be in a very professional frame of mind. So, um, whatever issues come up, I mean, again, to the extent that Magnus would have an edge, I would think it's because like, if you control for all extraneous factors, Magnus has a you know long track record of being a better chess player. Yeah, so, um, that's yeah, significant. Yeah. But, it, but I'm, yeah. I'm tempted to say, to, um, to say that there's an old uh, maxim in in soccer that uh, I'm, I'm kind of mod- paraphrasing this, but you know chess, chess is a simple game played between two players with 32 pieces over 64 squares, and at the end. Magnus Carlsen always wins. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know if you're a soccer fan, but it's there's a famous phrase that in, involving Germany winning. But anyway, that's that's another story. <laughs> yeah, there's. I mean, you could. You're welcome to tell it. I have passing familiarity with soccer. I watched the World Cup. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, it's a, it's a, people that that uh, know about soccer, they'll they'll understand that. So, but yeah, okay, but yeah. but you know what I mean. You know, Magnus just at the end. He seems to pull it out. Um, yeah, we we saw it in the last two matches. But yeah, against Karyakin, who you know, I thought it, Magnus was just going to whack that one. Yeah, yeah. and he, he, you know, he was that close, that close to to going down. Uh, Fabiano, well, yeah, he started well, but you know, by the end, he was, you know, Magnus was. Kind of, you felt he he wanted to um, you know bring it to a close and just you know he wanted to get to the rapids. He felt I couldn't do it. You know he he looked rattled by the end, so rattled that he wanted to just kind of half out and go to the go to the rapids. So yeah, but similar to what I was saying about Nepo, that's another thing where it's like obviously he's studying the match history closer than anyone else and trying to make adjustments. So you you would think, I mean, he did obviously. You know, he failed to convert that game one against Caruana, as you mentioned, which was, uh, um, you know, a uh, turning point in the match. But certainly he he did seem to learn the lesson, maybe overlearn the lesson of where um, he didn't over like um, against Karyak and he overpressed and ended up losing because he got frustrated with the draws. Mm-hmm. Whereas against Caruana, if anything, you know, he was under criticism for underpressing when he he uh, agreed to a draw in the last game to send it to rapid tie breaks. So, I mean, yeah. it does seem like maybe he calibrates over time, but, um, but yeah, uh, 
just just a couple other questions on this um, as we record today, Daniel, and we're actually going to get this episode out pretty quickly. But Magnus was playing a bunch of blitz on Lee Chess last night. He played like 30 plus games yesterday, 30 games the day before. The day before that, Dr. Nickerstein, a.k.a. Magnus, played like 17 bullet games. So it's another case where people online are weighing in as if this uh, – has some some big implication? Is he taking the match seriously enough? So on and so forth. Where, where do you come down? Does this stuff matter? I don't think so. If it works yeah. for him, it works for him. You know, Magnus has always said, I go my own way. And if, if it keeps him sharp, that's fine. You know, he, he knows best. He's he's always said that in the in the past. You know, I trust myself, I trust my judgment. So it's so it seems to me that you know that kind of thing is um sign of confidence. But, you know, he's not changing his routine. Fine. Yeah. And one can only study so much chess in a day. So they're going to be blowing off steam somehow, you know. So if if playing Blitz or Bullet is his way of doing it, uh, to me, it's not that big a deal. But I, um, I just would have expected him to do it in, uh, you know, over the chessboard. <laughs> I, I mean, not online, because it seems to me that, um, you know, it's a very different kind of discipline. Uh, over the board chess so you know i'm sure he's got sparring partners but anyway but listen like i said it's up to him that's yeah you know, it works it, it's worked so far i'm, I'm not so, gonna knock it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i'm with you um but others are uh, have been a bit concerned for magnus um i think he knows he knows what he's doing yeah um so Tying it up, bringing it back to opening. So as you say, it's really tough to to predict. Magnus obviously has an immensely wide repertoire. Nepo, he seems to play E4 slightly more often than um, other moves, but still he, he's played a lot of Englishes. Um, do, you, do you have any strong inklings of uh, openings that will be seen? Well, like I said, you know, I think playing these kind of more forcing uh, openings where it's possible to play more forcing lines, that's definitely dangerous. Um, it, it seems to me, I mean, who knows that it seems to me that there are, there are kind of two strategies you can employ in these world championship matches. You can kind of stick with one opening and say, right, here's my line in the sand. This is the one I'm going to stick with. Like in the 1980s matches, uh, where Karpov and Gasparov battled out, you know, these Queen's gambits and Karpov decided I'm playing the Queen's gambit. And that was their battleground. Um, so you can do that, or you can decide to, to run. You yeah. can switch. And for example, in uh, Reykjavik 72, Fisher decided as black, well, he was going to play a range of openings. You know, he, he played the Nidorf, then he switched to the Pits, he played the Alekins as black, and, you know, so you can do that. And um, Nepo has shown that in the candidates, you know, he played a little bit of a variety so that could happen. You know, he's had a lot of time to work. So it's possible we're going to see a variety of openings. Don't you think, though, that in in the modern computer age, like in a 14-game match, don't you think they might feel some elevated risk of kind of going for the surprise opening? Because if they step in something, you know, if they run into something that's, that's bad, um, you know, uh, there's not a lot of time to recover. Um, whereas if you, if you test one opening and you don't get a bad position, then, I mean, you've, you've got to be, you know, degrees of confidence, more confident in your work. If you're like working on one repertoire, uh, for, for months, um, I don't know. We'll, it, we'll find out, it, I guess. But it sets you up, you know? Um, yeah. But I mean, you've been doing it for months. They have three days or whatever, you know? Yeah, that's so, very true. Yeah. It depends how solid the opening is. You know, the Sveshnikov actually, you know, it used to be the kind of height of madness when it was, came out in the 1970s. And then, you know, in the past, well, I would say 15, 20 years, um, it's been appreciated with the computers that actually the Sveshnikov is a completely sound opening. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Gelfand proved that in World Championship match against Anand. And, you know, last time out, uh, Carlson took it on and proved that it's, it, it's actually a very solid opening. So, yes, there are some openings you can do that with. But if you want to play slightly more offbeat ones, then you've got to kind of run. You've got to switch. Yeah. So it yeah. just it just depends which one it is, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I fear we may see a lot of Roy Lopez's. Um, Maybe. Although, no, it could be. 
Yeah, although I wouldn't discount uh, Magnus playing the Catalan. I mean, it, a, a lot of it depends on sort of uh, how much they're trying to to steer towards a certain type of position. But as you say, like, you know, Magnus's play has evolved. He's become more dynamic and mm. uh, Nap- Napomnici has become more solid. So who knows if they're even going to have sort of stylistic ambitions, you know? But, by the way, the, t- the time control has a bearing on, on, on this, that, you know, they're not playing with an increment. At least not, not not until move sixty. Oh, interesting. I, I think I, I might have got that completely wrong. <laughs> I better check on the rules before I start to point. <laughs> yeah, um, I I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's it's forty and two, and then twenty and one. I, we we should probably look this up now, <laughs> and and then only increment after move sixty. So I think without an increment. You know, that means you can maybe, I don't know if that has a bearing on, on your opening choice. Maybe you can play something a bit riskier. You know, um, Magnus is not afraid to use the, the clock as a weapon. I just fact-checked it. You're right. No increment until move 61. Yeah, that really adds uh, adds some drama. I'm, I'm oh, a bit surprised. Yeah, uh, Yeah, but that, for me, that's good. I like that. You know, I'm not a fan of increments, uh, early increments. I think over, after move 60, it's fine. Of course, you know, we're not playing with the Germans or whatever. Um, <laughs> th- those those days are long gone. Um, but uh, no, I, I'm, I'm glad. I think increments are just a kind of, um, yeah, not, not a fan at all. <laughs> Snowflake um, chess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I've got uh, one more related question um, from the Patreon mailbag. Uh, Thank you for supporting the podcast, Chad Oliver. Um, And it's more about world championship history. But anyway, he he asks, is it considered a poor form or a breach of chess etiquette for a chess player's second to make a comment or give an opinion about the player they seconded with without the player's consent? For instance, Rustam Kashimjanov seemingly talked out of school about working with Caruana during the 2018 World Championship. But conversely, Peter Hein Nielsen said that whatever information he shared about his time as Anand's second was with Anand's approval. So I don't know if you're up on this. I also talked about it on a forthcoming episode with uh, WGM Tachi Babrahamian. But um, did you hear what uh, Kashim Zanov's comments were? Um, yeah, to be honest, I, I kind of flick flick through the headlines of it so I, I i don't i don't know exactly what he said um but, but was fabiano a little bit upset with not publicly that i'm aware of um again it's uh chad just felt like uh he maybe said some things he shouldn't have said uh, the the person writing the email but um but yeah i mean to me i mean there was a again i talk about this in another forthcoming episode but he talked about Fabi's ta- talent level maybe not being at the same level as some oh, yes, of the other yes. elite players. Yes. No, I did catch yeah. that. Uh, I th- I thought that was very unfortunate. Um, I I I don't like this kind of. Uh, I, I think it's a false split between talent and hard work. You know, you say, "Oh yeah, he works harder. Oh yeah, he's more talented." Um, you know, hard hard work is a given for for any chess player, and if you don't put the work in, you know you you're not going to get there. Um, but yeah, I think uh, no, I, I didn't I didn't agree with that comment at all uh, from Rustam. I thought that was that was a bit unfortunate. I, I wouldn't have put it that my, way myself. I mean, maybe there's a, there's another way of putting, it, but you know, I, I think Rustam did a fantastic job with Fabiano. I think he was a brilliant second. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I, I, I think that's that's a false dichotomy, you know, this talent and hard work thing. Yeah, and for what it's worth, again, in the aforementioned interview with Peter Doggers, Peter did ask Fabiano about uh, their split. And Fabiano said that as far as he knows, they're on good terms, although, I don't know the whole timeline of like when comments were said or whatever, sure. but anyway, I don't really, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have too much to add. So Chad, um, I hope that answered your question. If not, um, email me and we'll get a cl- clarification and discuss it on a future episode. Cause I'm not sure if I, if we address the specific comments you're referring to. Okay. Um, but anyway, we got a lot to cover with uh, Grandmaster King, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. 
Have you checked out the new game review feature from chess.com? Of course, in addition to all their other features, they have now upgraded one of my favorite features, the ability to go through your game immediately after you play it and learn from your mistakes. And now you can do it and get actual feedback in words from your virtual coach. So it doesn't just show you that a move was a mistake, but it explains why. They've also added great moves in addition to brilliant moves, since those brilliant moves can be hard to come by. And they've updated their accuracy score Ranking. So one of the many improvements coming from chess.com, be sure to check it out and play there if you haven't already been. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood was founded in 2018 by Grandmaster Avtik Gregorian. It's a chess education platform that gives you a structured path to work to improve your chess. For $29 a month, you get instant access to over 200 hours of Grandmaster prepared video content and includes openings, middle games, and end games. They also have an active online community where you can find training partners and fellow chess enthusiasts. Uh, Don't forget to check out their free content. They have a great blog where their grandmasters share uh, their own thoughts on chess improvement. I get it delivered to my inbox. So to learn more about uh, Chess Mood and what they offer, be sure to check out their website, chessmood.com. And we are back. So Daniel, you've been hard at work on your Kalashnikov opening uh, course, brand new for Chessable, King's Kalashnikov. Um, And it sounds like you've got a long history with this opening. You first played it when you were 12 years of age. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. It was was kind of one of the first uh, serious openings I played. I I, I only ever had one uh, coach, a chap called Nigel Pover, who's an English international master. And he was my coach for for a couple of years in my my teenage years. And um, he started playing this. But actually, in those days, it was kind of the the um, black played it as a called the, the Lerventhal variation. I, I know we're going into detail here, but basically, where <laughs> black plays e five, and then after knight b five, black plays a six. Right. Then... That's yeah. I'm such a sorry. I'm such an ignorant Kalashnikov aficionado that that's when I f- first saw your course. I thought that's the line that it was, not yeah, uh, not with d six. Go ahead. So so that's the Lerventhal. Um, and that's how everyone used to play it a long time ago. It's not very good for black. But right. basically, this move, after e5, knight, b5, d6, I mean, it's such a kind of normal move. And and yet, um, basically, when this was sort of revived in the 1980s, it was like some kind of extraordinary move. And and there were players, there was a, there was a little kind of Austrian contingent of players um, Herzl and Fowland and Wittmann that used to play this. And then Sveshnikov picked it up. Uh, the great Yevgeny Sveshnikov. Yeah. And of course, the, the systems are related, you know, both have this backward deep one. And when Sveshnikov picked it up, he found some really interesting new ideas. Um, so yeah, I was playing E5 as a kid, but at that time, not, uh, you know, this was kind of club chess. Actually, very few people went knight b5 anyway. You know, they played one of these other moves like knight f3, knight, knight b3. Anyway, they are fine for black. So I used to get good positions. <laughs> and and I even now I find, you know, some of my students uh, play the, the e5 and a lot of their opponents don't go knight b5. And if they don't, then black is already very comfortable. So, it, you know, it's funny that... I've kind of come full circle and I've sort of come back to this anyway. Um, And what I like about it is it's a very classical opening. You know, you put a pawn in the center of the board and you're fighting for control of the center. You know, it's about control over D5 and E4, basically. So it's a little bit different to other kind of Sicilians where, you know, you're playing, you know, sometimes you're playing on the flank, um, you know, down the C file, which sometimes does happen. But with this, a lot of it is about the central central control. Yeah, and obviously it bears some similarities to the Sveshnikov. In fact, white can transpose into the Sveshnikov if they go knight c3. So what are the primary differences with the knight on b5? So what are the primary differences like evaluating the Sveshnikov compared to when they go for the Meroxy setup in uh, the Kalashnikov? Well, first of all, sorry, just to pick you up on that, white cannot transpose into a Sveshnikov. Ah, so after knight b5, 
d6, knight 1, c3. You push the knight back with a6, the knight goes back to a3. And then, yeah, after knight, basically you don't transpose to a Sveshnikov. In that position, you play bishop e7. That's my main line. Ah, okay. So black could transpose into the... Black can. If they went knight f6. Yeah, but, but, we, yeah. but I don't want to. And the point is this. You know, one of the massive differences between the Kalashnikov and the Sveshnikov, with the Kalashnikov, there is far less theory. With the Sveshnikov, if you're a world championship candidate, <laughs> 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 then, you know, and you have your seconds with you, and, you know, you're a professional player... There are all these variations, and it, it is so mind blowing. You know, it just one of these sacrificial lines. You know, can send you off into some parallel universe where you know your playing moves out to move thirty one, and you've got to know it really well. The Kalashnikov is not like that at all. In fact, you know, the kind of range of positions you play is much simpler, and basically pawn structure determines strategy and the pawn structure in the kalashnikov is pretty much fixed you have that pawn on d6 you have the pawn on e5 and so it's much easier to determine strategy it's much easier to get a handle on the kind of strategies involved when you play the kalashnikov compared to the sveshnikov sveshnikov is mind-blowing i used to play it myself and you know if you're not up with the, the latest games from the russian junior championship you can get blown off the board. And I did. Right. <laughs> also won, won some nice games, but do you see what I mean? Whereas the Kalashnikov, yeah. it's hard to get tripped up in the Kalashnikov, basically. Okay, strong endorsement. I mean, I've, I've been playing the Shvesnikov, so I, I might have to incorporate it. Uh, but but least, uh, and, and how did you fare with it? Did you sometimes get tripped up because you didn't well, know? Theory? I'm at the level, you know, I'm like 2100 FIDE, and, I, you know, it being my opening, my experience has been I know it as well or better than my opponents, but I have a feeling if I were playing, you know, 2400 on up, it would be a different story. Like, you know, I could get into real trouble. Not, again... Not because it's an unsound opening, but just because like my knowledge isn't at the level that would be required. Um, so yeah, sooner or later, when I get to twenty four hundred, you know, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'll have to learn more. But but yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, as you say, the structure is similar. Um, so it, it could be fun to experiment with. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would say you know, if you're a Sveshnikov player already, then it's it would be very easy for you to just do a little sidestep for to the Kalashnikov. And I mean, I should tell you my kind of uh, opening development. So I started, you know, playing E5, like when I was 12 years old, I used to play E, you know, 4 E5. Well, the, the Lerventhal or the, or the Kalashnikov um, for like a, two or three years. And then when I was around 15, I started playing the Sveshnikov. You know, in the, in the 70s, in the late 70s, that was all the rage. And, and it was a very natural step for me to go into the Sveshnikov, having played the Kalashnikov, both with the backward d pawn. Much more complex. And listen, when you're a teenager, you've got all the time in the world. And I did. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I could study it. And I used to trip people up. And it was, it was fine. You know, it was a fun opening. But then... It was time to grow up, and I started playing the Nidorf. Another opening. You, if you you're you're beginning to get a trend here, where Black often plays the pawn to e5 and plays with the backward d pawn. So all these openings are related, but the Nidorf is the most sophisticated because you have more flexibility. You know, do you leave the pawn on e7, put it to e6, or go to e5? So, you know, the, the Nidorf is a, a kind of really high class opening. Uh, whereas, you know, coming back to the Kalashnikov, you plonk the pawn on e5 as quickly as possible. So it doesn't have it doesn't have the guile, the sophistication of the Nidorf. Uh, I think probably the Kalashnikov is, is well named in that respect. Right. You know, but that's what. Yeah. And that's what makes it easier to play. It's, it's pretty think. crude, but it never jams. <laughs> <laughs> I um, love it. Um, um, and what's, but yeah, it's easier to play basically. And do you have a favorite opening, Daniel? Ooh, I mean, I do like the Nidorf uh, as black, um, and you know, I love playing when it when it went well. I mean, I had my disasters, but when it went well, the Nidorf was 
such a nice opening to play. You know, you you had you get that that heady mix of yeah. um, solidity and dynamism. That's what you want as a, as the player of the black pieces. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know that's fun. Wouldn't be shocked to see that in the world championship. Um, no, uh, well, could be. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a sort of related question from Akko Hadari. I hope I said your name right, Akko. Um, and thank you for supporting Perpetual Chess. So he says, hello, Daniel. I've been a big fan of your channel, your chess-based products, and also recently your chessable courses. I also should say that your article, How Good Is Your Chess, was being published in Iran's chess magazine, and it was very, very popular. Indeed, the first chess session in a chess club I had was one of those I still remember very clearly. So his question to you is, he's heard a lot of good things about your book on the Spanish, and he was wondering, do you have any plans to republish it or even add a video course to it on chessable or chess base wow Thanks. that that is well that's 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 an incredible question uh, there's there's mm -hmm. a lot i could touch on there but okay do let's deal with the spanish one first that is a really old book um and i that was co-written with an italian chap um i golly that that might be difficult to to arrange but um yeah i mean i love playing the spanish with white i have to say that's always been one of my favorite openings. Again, it kind of combines uh, that kind of solidness with you know, incredible strategic complexity with white. Um, so I've already always enjoyed playing that. Uh, so no no plans to, um, to, to do a, a new version of that. Um, although, no, I do, uh, interesting. Okay. I, I do like the Spanish very, very much. Coming back to the, the thing about uh, it's, it's, it's really nice to hear that... Um, he likes this article, How Good Is Your Chess? Basically, I write this article every month and it goes in uh, an English chess magazine called Chess. And incredibly, I've been writing this every month for, wait for it, 30 years. I can't wow. believe I'm saying that. When I, when I started out, it was like a bit of a joke. It's it's one of these things where, you know, you, you give a test game and people have to guess the moves and you give them points. You know, it's it's a simple thing. Um but I put a lot of effort into it. I really enjoy it. It's a real, for me, it's a real discipline to, to analyze the game in great detail and to work out strategies. And I mean, I cannot believe I've been doing it for that long, but, and after a few years, I've got to say this, it turned into a real drag. I just thought, what am I doing? You know, this is like a <laughs> millstone around my neck when I wanted to run off and do other things and whatever. But it's come completely full circle well, I'm actually really proud of this article and I'm proud of the fact that that I'm still going. <laughs> and um, I, I really like doing it, actually. It's like I sit down, I shut the office door and I analyze and it's 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 like, um, I remember this this um, artist who, who was famous for, for, you know, doing kind of Jackson Pollock type right. canvases. And he said, do you know what? Every once in a while I sit down and I do a life, a still life. I get a, a bowl of fruit, a bunch of flowers, and I sit there with a pencil, and I, you know, I have the discipline of, of drawing a still life. And then I go back to doing my Jackson Pollock stuff on the canvas. I feel that way with this article. You know, I do lots of other stuff, but this is a real discipline to analyze the game in great detail. Um, and if I, if I still play chess seriously, then I think it would do me a lot of good, actually. <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, sorry, sorry, go on, Ben. Sorry. No, you go ahead. I was going to say it's funny that this guy says he uh, he saw the article in this Iranian chess magazine because there's a story about that as well. Basically, I send this, so it's published in England, but also published. It's translated in in um, a magazine in Germany. Schach, Schach 64. Um, so that goes there every month as well. But then I was at an Olympiad a few years ago, the the Tromso Olympiad. And this guy came up to me and um, and said, yeah, thank you for sending me your articles. It's great that we can publish them. And I said, "Where?" where? I got, what? He said, yeah, yeah, here's, here's a bag of pistachio nuts. Please, please have this as a thank you. I was like, <laughs> what is going on here? So he said, yeah, yeah, you, you, you allow me to publish them in my Iranian magazine. Really? Did, did did I give permission for that? I had no idea. So I got a I got a as payment, 
I got a big bag of pistachio nuts. <laughs> Great. I love pistachio. So, <laughs> but I was going, I gave you permission. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sent you an email ages ago. It's a, and I've completely forgotten this. I mean, seriously, this, this, this must have been like 25 years ago, and it's gone completely out of my head. Apparently, I gave permission for my articles to be used <laughs> in the Iranian well, magazine. And I've had other people, I've, you know, other Iranians have mentioned this to me that they really like the article, but it's kind of funny, you know. I didn't know I was big in Iran. That's great. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I have to say, I mean, it's been said before, but that's what I love about chess. I mean, I'm chatting with you in the UK from New Jersey. We have an email from Echo in, uh, in Iran, and we're discussing the World Championship, which will be in Dubai. Uh, you got to love it. Involving yeah. a Russian and a Norwegian. <laughs> got, got to love the, uh, yeah, yeah. the the global appeal. And regarding chess, um, chess Magazine, um, the British Chess Magazine, you can subscribe online. So I actually read your column today because I was just wanting to be up on what you were doing. So for five uh, five British pounds, I'm you know pay them through PayPal, and boom, you can download uh, download the PDF, and they also give you a PGN, which is great. By the, um, by the way, it's not it's Chess Magazine, not British Chess Magazine. Okay. British, British, British Chess Magazine is is another um, journal. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a British magazine called. Yes, Chess, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to, to be clear, um, so yeah, excellent stuff, um, Daniel. We've we've only got a bit more time, but first we're going to take one more break and then hop into a few more listener questions. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by our old friends at Chessable.com. Hopefully, you know by now about their proprietary move trainer technology that helps you remember tactical patterns as well as opening sequences. Whatever aspect of your game you're looking to work on, there is an excellent chance that Chessable has something for you to help. They're also constantly releasing new courses. In the pipeline currently, they've got an, a lifetime repertoire, one E4 from none other than Anish Giri. And they've got the Ginger GM, Simon Williams, soon to release a treatment of G legendary Grandmaster Alexei Shiro's Fire on Board, plus so much more. So just be sure to always go to chessable.com and take a look at what's new. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by aimchess.com. Hopefully by now you guys are all aware of their awesome algorithm that gives you actionable tips to improve your game. But on this ad, we wanted to make sure you're aware of the Magnus Nepo Prediction Challenge. Go to magnusnepo.com, sponsored by Aim Chess, and it's they basically ask you a bunch of questions to make predictions based on uh, what you think will happen in the upcoming World Championship. And there's lots of prizes like chess boards signed by Magnus, chessable courses, premium membership to Chess24 and Aim Chess, et cetera, et cetera. So fun opportunity. You can even have groups with your friends. So be sure to go to magnusnepo.com before the much-awaited World Championship begins. And we are back. And Daniel, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all the listener questions, but this one I, I got to gotta get in a longtime friend of the pod, Jeff Anderson's question, which is, he says, Hello, Grandmaster King. I'm one of your Patreon subscribers. Thank you for your excellent commentaries and content. Is there some is there some way when commentating on a game that Black wins, you could flip the board so that Black's pieces are on the bottom? Previously, you've told us subs subscribers that there's no way to do this. But if I, I thought if I asked you again in this public forum, maybe some tech head out there could give you the answer. Oh, I've been put on the spot. <laughs> I know. But basically, um, I made a decision right at the start to just look at the games uh, for my videos from, from White's viewpoint. Um, I mean, it's partly because it's, it's a convention in books that you, you always look from White's viewpoint. Um, but the other thing is, if I flipped it every time, like for the, from the winner's side, it's a spoiler. Right. So basically, you know, I like to keep a little bit of suspense in the games. Um, you know, when it's in the balance, people don't know. I try to. Some, sometimes, you know, you give the game away. But, uh, yeah, for that reason, I don't want to give a spoiler. So, of course, at the start of the recording, I can decide which way to flip it. But viewers can't because it's a recording. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I was watching one of your Magnus Nepo videos and you were presenting a puzzle from the black side and <laughs> you actually said, uh, I'm going to flip this one and you for, for a change or something like that. Like you had a, you had a glint in your eye because of uh, how rare it was. And I could tell it was like a ongoing conversation. So yeah, exactly. Uh, Jeff, 
<laughs> so so apologies, Jeff. Um, that that's that's how it is. <laughs> okay, and and Jeff, I did my best. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but thanks for the question, Jeff, and and thanks for supporting. Okay. Uh, likewise from me. And uh, from Greg Smith, he asks, uh, where can we find recordings of you playing jazz bass? Um, and then he shared a photo. And we discussed your music career a bit in our last uh, last interview, but but he wants to hear it. Oh, have you got a photo there? Uh, so, no, he linked to a photo of, uh, yeah, of you playing with uh, Nettie Robinson, who does some cool-looking chess art. So he, he had a photo, but... Um, or he linked to a photo, but no right. video, no yeah, audio. Yeah, I've played played about three gigs with Nettie. She's she's a fantastic musician. Uh, she she composes, um, and she she's a singer. I mean, she's you know um, studied music at college, and her husband uh, Tony, um, a fantastic musician, um, plays plays saxophone. And yeah, we've done some gigs uh, along with some other musicians. You know. Doing doing their compositions and some jazz standards and stuff, um, really great fun. I I don't know if there are recordings of them. I know there was one which was on YouTube, but I can't. I couldn't when I looked the other day. I couldn't find it. Um, I'll have to ask Nettie. But it, absolute uh, joy playing with with uh, Nettie and Tony. Um, yeah, fantastic musicians and yeah, brilliant fun. Um, unfortunately, the last couple of years, for, for obvious reasons, you know, I haven't been able to get together with with people to to play. Um, you know, it's just been difficult to be sociable. Um, yeah. Funnily enough, the reason I've, I, I'm going to have to go fairly soon is I'm, I'm going to a rehearsal in oh, that's this great. evening. Uh, but with another band, uh, I'm playing electric bass and, and we just do kind of, you know, 60s and 70s covers. We're, we're just a kind of pub rock band. Um, it's yeah, got a got a gig coming up in a couple of weeks, so that'll be fun. Um, oh, how, in, how in can uh, any Londoners yeah. come check you out? Oh yeah, the the Swan in Hampton Wick, that's the pub, um, and it's just over Kingston Bridge on the Hampton Wick side. Um, it's on. Hang on, let me get the date. Saturday the twenty seventh. So um, that'll be that's game two of the World Championship. So so hopefully Carlson and Nepo will finish the game quickly because. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna have to do my roundup, and then I'm gonna play a gig in the evening. Um, so yeah, Saturday the 27th at the Swan, the Swan Pub in Hampton Wick, just over Kingston Bridge. You turn right. Um, it's on the Thames. Beautiful location. Um, grotty pub, but that's that's life. That's music. As it should be. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pub rock. Um, <laughs> and uh, we haven't practiced. We've had two practices in about the last. The last last time we played a gig was two years ago. So it'll be rough and ready, but it'll be great fun. Man, I don't get out much, but if I lived in London, I'd be all over it, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the band is pretty rough and ready, but listen, you can always enjoy a pint. <laughs> That's the great thing about pub rock. <laughs> right. So just, I think what might be my last question, since I know you have to head out to your rehearsal. Um, I recently, with John Fernandez, did a, a podcast recapping uh, Victor Kortznoy's Chess in My Life. So in, in my research for that, I, of course, came across uh, some of your your videos about having played him. And if I'm correct, you were two and two against him. Um, and, and, um, so what are your best Kortznoy stories, uh, Daniel? Oh, boy. Uh, where, where do we start? Yeah, I played against <laughs> him four times. All decisive. He won two. I won two. Um, Which is amazing. Well, listen, you can hear. I'm very proud of that, I have to say. Um, I, I mean, I am a, a you know, complete fan. I was a complete fan of, of Victor. And, and for for all, all his um, idiosyncrasies, I mean, he was an extraordinary man. And, you know, when, when you grow up, you know, I just remember that, that match in 78 against Karpov. Uh, the Baggio World Championship match, uh, when it got to, when he fought back to five all, and that that game, that fifth win of Court Noise, that Rook and Pawn end game, that was sensational. You know, that's what I grew up on, and yeah, just just a fan ever since. And boy, was I rooting for for Victor then, and so sorry that uh, you know he he lost that next game. Basically, um, I remember that so clearly. I had a chance to discuss that game with Victor. We played a couple of times in, in the Swiss league 
um, you know, this was, I mean, for me, that was an incredible honor to play against him. Um, and yeah, I took the opportunity to talk about the game and actually I'd analyzed it myself. Myself and I found, although Korshner had he he had analysed this in great detail in one of his books, and and he showed how Karpov could have drawn the game, um, but actually I found another way. Uh, I would say a, a simpler way for for Karpov to draw, and and I showed that to him. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, yeah, I, and it was. I mean, listen, it, that sounds a bit crass. It sounds like I'm going. You know, I found another way. Um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't like that. It was kind of a discussion about the game because, you know, I was you know I said to him, look, <laughs> I love that game, <laughs> you know, and it, and it was you know it was a kind of I just wanted to say that really, but but we discussed it and you know he and you know we looked at it on a chessboard very quickly and uh, he said yeah yeah looks looks good and but but he but he said to me yeah it was well, it was a draw but that's kind of irrelevant, you know, Korchnoi's concept in that Rook and Pawn end game was out of this world. I mean, it was, the whole game was like a saga. It was an epic game. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a total admirer. But yeah, but basically when I played Victor, uh, the two games where he, he beat me and he crushed me in two games, we had lovely post-mortems. He was charming. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I beat him, oh boy, <laughs> we saw a bit of. Because look, compared to him, I'm a patzer. Right. Um, and the first time I beat him, uh, yeah, he basically pushed the pieces away and uh, and left without a handshake. Um, it, as as Peter Svidler once said, it's it's kind of a badge of honor to be sort of insulted by caution. <laughs> uh, so you know, I claim that. Um, yeah, uh, actually, I'll tell you one one funny story about Corsair. And this is, I'm telling this to you almost to, to get it out. This is this is so painful. Um, it was a London Chess Classic, and it was live commentary online. And Corsair had been invited there as a guest, and it was just after the Anand Gelfand World Championship match, and where, I mean, Anand obviously pipped it at the end, but Gelfand had played incredibly well. And so it was really, you know, it was just the match was just over. And, and so I wanted to, Victor came on stage on the it was in front of a live audience. It was live online. And Victor came on stage and I, I, I you know, it was one of my kind of first questions. I said, you know, what did you think of the World Championship match? Um, you know, what did you think of Gelfand's play? Now, Victor was his hearing wasn't so great. And after, after I asked the question, you know, what did you think of Gelfand? He said, what do I think of my girlfriend? <laughs> and I went, no, 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 please. What did, what did you think of Gelfand? My girlfriend? You repeated it. And I mean, I just kind of died. <laughs> And basically, the end, the interview went downhill from there. It was, <laughs> it was not good, you know. That's hilarious. Um, I, can't, I can't imagine. Yeah, but anyway. I would I would buckle trying to interview him. I would be terrified. It, I mean, the thing is, you know, I played against him. I, you know, I, I, and interviewed before, so you know, it's not like not like we didn't. He didn't know me or something. But it, yeah, it was really embarrassing. And and of course, the audience was kind of in stitches, and I was just kind of dying. Um, but I, I, you know, Court Victor was just an amazing man for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Amazing. Well, very last question, Daniel, I know you'll be covering the games of the world championship on your channel. Um, I believe not working in another professional capacity this time, watching from the comforts of your home. So what's the Daniel King approved way of watching the match? Will you be tuning into one of the broadcasts? Do you keep the sound off? I'm guessing there's some tea involved. Uh, how, how are you going to watch these games? Yeah, in a pretty chill way. You know, it's funny, 2018, I was kind of in the absolute thick of it in the eye of the storm, you know, being press office there and then uh, interviewing the players afterwards. This time I wanted to just chill um for all kinds of reasons you know the last few years have just been mad and and mm -hmm. i and the whole of the pandemic business and i just thought i don't need all that hassle um so i decided not to head to dubai um i'm not doing commentary i'm just doing the the roundups and do you know what 
it feels really great. So I'm going to be watching this match as as a, a really keen spectator, and I will look forward to doing my roundups after. So yeah, I'm going to be sitting here in my office and with my cup of tea and just really enjoying the games as a spectator. I'll be tuning into. Well, the Chess24 have have a pretty amazing lineup of commentators. Chess.com as well. Uh, the FIDE official broadcast has, has I think, Anand. Um, yeah. Chess24 has, uh, I think, uh, Anish Giri and Yudit Polgar. Um, who have and I missed out? Chess.com has uh, Hess, Wrench, and Fabiano. Has Fabiano. Uh, yeah. I'll be checking them all out. Um, yeah. You know, I'm... It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, so I, I'm really, really looking forward to it, I have to say. And, I, and I'm just going to be a very interested and fascinated spectator. Yeah, same for me. Spoiled for choice. Yeah. Well, Daniel, I know you got to get to your rehearsal. This has been awesome. So hopefully we can do it again sometime and uh, enjoy the festivities of the World Championship. Thanks very much, Ben. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's fun to chat again. Perpetual Chess is proud to be a member of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Be sure to check out their sports and pop culture related podcasts as well. I also, as always, would like to thank Matthew Passy for producing the show. Without Matthew, Perpetual Chess would not exist. And I want to thank everyone who listens to the show, whether it be on your own without telling anyone about it, keeping it secret, or if you're helping to spread the word, all the better, whether it be telling a friend about a particularly impactful interview or whether it be writing a positive review online, all of that stuff helps get the word out and helps Perpetual Chess continue to grow. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those that provide financial support to Perpetual Chess. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible in its current form. And I would like to give uh, special thanks to the following people and entities. Here comes the list. Uh, Chessable.com, David Lazarus of Lazman Chess, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adaptive Interactive Web Designs and Services, the Apprentices Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Tharwar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Golick, Hampus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King Cell, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oplin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Michael Sullivan, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nace Twitch channel, Perry McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flemons, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Rick Rivas, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patchers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam. And I also would like to thank the following. Hashtag Chess Punks, who are the adult improvers on Chess Twitter. Ace Vallega, Adam Fowler, Adam Johansson, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Gruber, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Bruno Johnson, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadi, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens, of Rose City Chess in Portland, the Chess Dojo, Chess for Charity, Jacksonville, Chess Pats are Spain, 
Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood. I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskacek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Eric Baldwin, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Mayo Perea, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letard Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananes, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeff Davis, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse DeCumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Jones, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tolley, Juan Almagua, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tolley, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfellow, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fridell, I am Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Reiferth, Lars Reeson, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelyanova, aka Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Butolovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, Pablo Davila, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain. Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, um, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard McCormick, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Samson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malagu, the Say Chess YouTube channel and publishing empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwater, Sergey Makagon, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, St- Stephen Miller and Tom George, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, Zachary Hoskin, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone.